Good morning. Uh, today's scripture is Luke 24, 28 to 32. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it, is, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? These are the last verses of the story of the journey of two disciples returning to Emmaus. They are in deep thought and in discussion and full of emotion. They are trying to make sense of the events of the week that happened in Jerusalem, and most importantly, the whereabouts of Jesus. Remember, this conversation is taking, is taking place after the resurrection. As they're walking, a stranger appears next to them and asks them about this conversation. More importantly, he asks them about how they're doing. He asks about the sadness that, that this uh, stranger sees in their eyes. Cleopas, one of the two disciples, looks at the stranger and says, basically, I'm thinking, seriously, where have you been? Haven't you heard about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all people? If you imagine a stranger coming to asking me what is going on in 2020, imagine what I would respond to them. Where have you been? So um, Cleopas cannot believe that this stranger has no idea. So they, the two disciples, go on to retell the passion story, the resurrection story of Jesus. They share about his betrayal, the women finding an empty tomb, the appearances of angelic beings, and how Jesus is nowhere to be found. The stranger joins the conversation and adds his words of wisdom, quoting scripture and schooling them on the word of God. Um, imagine having this conversation with the stranger on the road. After, deep, uh, after a deep theological and emotional conversation, they finally reach their destination. The stranger who appears to the disciples appears to be continuing on his journey, but the two disciples urge him to stay with us. I think the disciples wanted to continue to feel the stranger's presence. Um, this chapter in the Bible is very interesting because we know who the stranger is. The narrator tells us it is Jesus, but these two individuals have no idea but, no, but they know they want to be around him. They have felt their hearts burning as they walk with this, with this uh, stranger. Jesus accepts the invita invitation to stay. They continue visiting, and they're about to share a meal. And then we read, When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. The two disciples immediately recognized Jesus. This, uh, this brings up a couple of questions for me. Why did Jesus decide to reveal himself at this moment and not on the road? Or why is it that the disciples were not able to recognize him until they were at the table? I think the table is a very special place. It is where we come to have a spiritual experience. It is where we feel the presence of Jesus. Remember, less than a week before Jesus uh, instituted uh, communion, remember this incident, you know, this, uh, um, this visit with uh, Cleopas is happening one week before, one week after, about a week or so after um, Jesus first instituted the, the communion. I think Jesus is demonstrating and modeling the importance of this ritual. 
Jesus vanishes, but doesn't leave them. He leaves them with a physical reminder, an experience of communion. He, left, he leaves them with comfort, leaves them with, with a ritual they could perform to remind them of Jesus' love. I think Jesus wants to remind us of a God who constantly wants to be with us. He breaks bread with his disciples before his death and, and immediately after his resurrection. On both occasions, Jesus leaves. And like I said, he, he leaves them not alone, but with tangible reminders of him. A sort of comfort objects that physically remind uh, them, them and us of Jesus' presence in our lives. Notice that I mentioned the phrase comfort object. The phrase is from the world of psychology. Let me explain why I reference it and make a connection to communion. A comfort object or a transitional object is most commonly referred to as an object used in early child development. The physical item, such as a blanket or a stuffed animal, is an extension of a young child's primary caregiver. It is a reminder of all the caregiver's good, including love, affection, care. This object can suit the child when time in need, or also remind them of this care and comfort when the caregiver is away. Think of Linus's blanket as a comfort object or a transitional object. When Linus carries his blanket around, it brings the comfort that he needs. I learned the importance of a transitional object in my work working with, with a high school student. The student had lived with his grandparents most of his life. His parents had left uh, Mexico and had come to the United States. And 10 years later, now he was reunited with his, with his parents. But this young uh, man missed his uh, grandparents terribly. And that's the reason he was in my office. We, you know, we processed, we talked, and as we were talking, this young man takes a 50 peso bill out of his wallet and tells me that his grandfather had given him this bill so that he could buy a snack on his trip in his journey to the United States. As you can tell, the, the young man never used this uh, bill. He, he, he showed the bill to remind me or to remind himself that there was comfort in seeing this 50 peso bill because it reminded of his grandparents and the love that he provided, that his grandfather provided for him. I think Jesus knows the importance of these transitional objects, especially when he instituted communion. Later in today's service, you will hear the following words. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. This do as often as you drink in remembrance of me. There are two things that come to mind as I read or listen to these words. The first thing that I think of is communion as a transitional object. As we physically take elements that represent Jesus, we ingest them and then participate with Jesus in the ritual to feel God's love and comfort. These elements become transitional objects of sort as we take them with us even after uh, communion. I am grateful that we have a God that, that wants to be with, be with us at all times. The second idea that comes to mind as I, when I read or listen to uh, the words of institution is the thankfulness of Jesus as he blesses the elements. Father Michael Van Sloan states that when Jesus instituted communion or the Eucharist, he established it as an act of thanksgiving. He took the bread and giving thanks, broke it. And he took the cup, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples. The word Eucharist comes from the word Eucharista, which means thanksgiving and or gratitude. So communion is like our, our great thanksgiving feast. 
that is available to us, not just once a year, but continuously. With physical reminders that God is with us after we leave the table. This is the great thanksgiving that we have an opportunity to be with Jesus and all Christians today participating in that feast. Communion connects us to the greater uh, Christian world. It connects us back to the disciples in the upper room and the two disciples who urged Jesus to stay with them at Emmaus. It connects us with our ancestors and to the future disciples who will be performing this ritual in remembrance of him. John Paul II describes communion as a foretaste of the eternal bank banquet of the heavenly Jerusalem. This is our great thanksgiving. Even though this year looks very different for us, and we may not be together with all of our, all of our families, we can come together to the table and participate in this communion, of this great Thanksgiving feast. When we come to the table, we're in God's time. So we don't have to measure, we don't have to think about how long this takes. We are present with, with God, with Jesus. We're present with all, with all the saints. And I'm grateful for this Thanksgiving feast because God is still with us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.